Hi, this is Dr. Jeffrey Goodlow, Medical Director for the EMS System for Metropolitan Oklahoma City in Tulsa. Today, we're here to talk about defibrillation strategies. We're always looking for better answers to sudden cardiac arrest and how we respond to that in EMS. For years now, we have done what most systems have done, and that is applied defibrillation with very deliberate energy at a very deliberate time. That part hasn't changed, but the energy has. Quite simply, over the last three and four decades, Americans and Oklahomans are physically getting bigger, so we have more space and more resistance to electrical flow to overcome than we ever have. And we've also found a very sobering fact, and that is, if you think about the myocardium as just one big muscle mass, when you and I shock that heart, when we shock that fibrillating heart, even if the electrical charge resets 99% of that muscle mass and we only have 1% that's still in fibrillation, sadly, that 1% will control the 99% and that's why your patient goes back into V-fib. That's a relatively new understanding of the challenge that you and I have to overcome to save that patient's life. So let's talk about these defibrillation pads because there's more to it than what we've ever realized before. When we're putting these pads on a patient, we're putting them where we want the electricity to start and where we want it to end. And that's a big reason why we've changed our strategy from what has historically been the parasternal area on the right and the heart's apex down on the lower left. And instead, our primary placement, as you know from the protocols in our EMS system here in Metropolitan Oklahoma City in Tulsa, is we've now changed it to an anterior pad placement, meaning right over where we think the heart is in the patient's body, and then right behind it so that we have a very straight front to back electrical flow. That's designed for two purposes. One, get more electrical charge into the heart muscle, the myocardium, and number two, to cover what we hope will be 100% of that myocardium so that our first shock is the only shock the patient needs to convert from a ventricular fibrillation dysrhythmia to a life-sustaining rhythm of what we hope will be a normal sinus rhythm right? We're increasing our energy strategies for that same reason. So for the patient that is less than an estimated 100 kilogram weight, we'll continue to do what we and other systems have traditionally done for 10, 15 years now, and that is 200 joules, 300 joules, 360 joules. However, for most adults that are now in excess of an estimated 100 kilogram body weight, 360 joules each and every shock. Now, let's talk about the concept that is a new concept for us, and that is double sequential external defibrillation. What do we mean by that? Just unpackage that term. Double, meaning two shocks. Sequential, meaning not simultaneous, but very close, one, 1001, two. And external, obviously, being what we've always done in EMS and that is applying pads to the external chest to deliver the electricity. Let's take a closer look at where exactly we want these pads placed, and then we'll talk about the benefit of that. So, for illustration purposes, we're gonna use our volunteer model here so we can look at where these pads are placed. Obviously, the patient you're working on in real arrest is gonna be supine, but First off, let's, let's put the original pair of pads on in the anterior posterior placement. This is the location where you're always going to start. First pad, anterior, okay? So we want this to be basically right over where we think the heart is in your patient. Now, questions come up about what do you do with an excessively obese chest? What do you do with pendulous breast? In those kind of situations, you may have to move the breast tissue aside and wedge that defibrillation pad right up under the breast. The bottom line is you're trying to get that pad as close to directly over that myocardial mass uh, as possible. 
okay? Second pad placement of that first set then becomes the mirror image of that anterior pad, okay? And so be careful, be careful to not place that pad too far inferiorly. If, if you are all the way below the scapula, the chances are very high that you are losing coverage of the myocardial muscle tissue, and that is going to decrease the success of that defibrillation. Now, so where do you put the second set of pads? Okay, now we're into this double sequential external defibrillation concept. The patient has failed to respond to the first three shocks using this anterior posterior pad placement. So what we're trying to do is we're establishing another electrical vector. What we're having to realize is part of the real reason, if not all of the real reason, that the patient has failed to convert out of ventricular fibrillation, we must be missing part of the myocardial field. We got to try to cover it. We're going to cover it shooting electricity from a different angle. So, now let's go back to what we have historically done in terms of placing the second pad just to the right of the sternum and the second pad down more over the, over the apex. So you want to be careful not to overlap the pads, but they can, they can safely touch just a little bit right here as you see, just a, a little bit of overlap is okay as long as you're not overlapping the actual uh, conductive uh, uh, area there. All that overlaps here is just the foam edge, okay? That's perfectly safe. Now, questions sometimes arise about what happens if the defibrillation pads interfere with the suction adherence of the rescue pump. And you can see that this is not just theory that in practical reasons on some patients as you overlay this it may very well cause decrease or complete absence of, of suction. Okay? We've had several occurrences in our system already where this has continued to be successful where there has been more than adequate compression and decompression even in the presence of these pads. It's always a balancing of risk benefit and particularly for patients that are in active fibrillation, getting them out through prompt, timely, correct defibrillation strategies, that's the bigger benefit. So if placing these pads correctly compromises how the rescue pump works, put the pump aside, revert to manual CPR, particularly as long as the patient is in fib, and concentrate on good manual compressions and effective but aggressive defibrillation strategies like we're detailing today. And again, the concept of all this is better electrical coverage of the myocardial muscle. Now, very important, and this is spelled out very carefully in the protocol for a reason, in the process of doing something beneficial for your patient, we don't want you to damage your equipment. Damaged equipment means we lose the capability of not only continuing to help that patient, we may lose the ability to help some patients down the road. So, we don't want your equipment out of service, and we don't want to add to your repair bills for the equipment. So, we have spent considerable time consulting physio control engineers, because obviously those are the devices that we're using in our system, correct? Here's what happens. You're not going to ever see this with the naked eye. For one thing, it's contained within the circuitry of the monitor defibrillator itself. But number two, it happens so fast, you couldn't even see it if you tried. Here's the deal. There's a little electrical relay, and in a period of just a few milliseconds, that relay closes, electricity is delivered, it opens back up. If the two defibrillations occur simultaneously, or so close that it's essentially simultaneous, monitor defibrillator one can inadvertently, unexpectedly, absorb the shock from monitor defibrillator number two. And that's when you get circuit boards being fried. Not good, right? So the key thing is we're gonna, we're gonna shock with defibrillation pad one, and then we're gonna shock with defibrillation pad set number two. 
That's why we call it double sequential external defibrillation, not double simultaneous external defibrillation. Shocking, three, two, one, 1001. Shock. So, what you just witnessed, excellent and perfect application of the double sequential external defibrillation technique. If for some reason you miss the 1001 shock cadence, make a single shock, resume CPR, pick up the double sequential external defibrillation the next time. So, special thanks to uh, Sergeant Lawrence and Lieutenant Travis from the Oklahoma City Fire Department, our excellent uh, model here, uh, Jaden for uh, being willing to uh, serve here for this educational purpose. And thanks to each and every one of you for your ongoing dedication to serving the EMS citizens that need you most in metropolitan Oklahoma City and Tulsa.